welcome. I was speaking this evening with the introduction, Professor Rick Van U. Professor Rick Van U over is the Professor of Medieval Theology in the Centre of Catholic Studies in the, um, the Theology Department here at Durham. And he's going to speak to you tonight on the Blessed Pan Jan Van Roosten. Two points of address. Absolutely perfect. Thank, thank you, Father Andy. Right, um, I'm always delighted uh, to be back here amongst friends. And, um, also, always delighted to talk about Jan van der Roosbroek. Um, he's a good friend of mine. Um, I wrote my doctorate on him in a previous millennium. I won't tell you how long ago that is. Um, and I, I'm firmly of the view that he deserves to be much better known than he is in the English-speaking world. Um, he was very influential in his own time, directly or indirectly. Um, as you can see from the dates on your handout, um, he led a very lengthy life from 1293 to 1381. Um, he was a priest first in Brussels, uh, in what is now the St. Michael's Cathedral. Um, at the time, it was called St. Goodala. Um, and when I was about 50 years of age, he retired into the Zonian Forest uh, outside of Brussels uh, with, and basically started up a small community. And eventually, they adopted the rule of uh, St. Augustine, so they became Augustinian canons. <coughs> um, he wrote in Middle Dutch um, because, as he says explicitly, he wanted to be understood by ordinary people. Uh, and we have letters from Rusbroek to uh, other members of religious communities in the vicinity, but also to lay people. Um, the, I, I've mentioned to you that he was very influential, directly or indirectly. Um, that is a chapter in its own right, but uh, very briefly, um, there was a Franciscan who was also uh, a member of the Modern Devotion, are you familiar with him with modern devotion? It, it's basically that uh, spiritual movement of the Low Countries in, in the 15th century with Gerardus Magnus, Geert Grote, um, as, as its founder. And uh, again, that proved very influential, the most famous exponent of, of which is, of course, the imitation of Christ by Thomas Akempis. It was an absolute bestseller and extremely influential in its own right. Um, Geert Grote, in, uh, as it happens, visited uh, Rysbroek uh, in, in Groenendaal, which is basically the name of his, uh, uh, of, of the priory that was founded by Rysbroek and a number of friends and family members. Anyway, uh, to come back, uh, so there, there is this um, Franciscan uh, friar called Herp, H. E-R-P, Harpius in, in Latin, and he wrote a book which basically copied and pasted from the Rosebrook left, right, and center, and that book was extremely influential, um, and we have manuscripts uh, in, in uh, Spain, in, 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 the, in, in England, um, France, all over Europe, basically. The same applies uh, to another work which is now forgotten, The Evangelical Pearl by a woman author, uh, 16th century, early 16th century. And uh, she too incorporates a lot of Rysbroek in her writings. And again, she became a major hit. She influenced uh, the school of, the French school of spirituality, Pirul uh, and environments. Uh, English spirituality, you, you find lots of manuscripts in England referring back to the Evangelical Pearl, and, and, and indeed occasionally Rusbrook, uh, even Germany. Um, and for those of you who are interested in more modern theology, um, Kierkegaard had, a, had the works of a pietist called Herhard of Stegen on his <coughs> shelves. And in those works by Herhard of Stegen, there is an ontology of the Evangelical Pearl. And I'm convinced that Rusbrook knew this work. So, but I'm trying to make clear that there's a sort of undercurrent of influence from Rysbroek writing at, uh, in, in the medieval, the high medieval period, all the way actually to the modern period. 
Anyways, um, so a few words about his ideas. Um, in, in the handout that I've given you, <clears throat> before I come to the ideas, um, I, I've mentioned there, uh, I've listed a, a few works uh, by Rysbrook. Uh, if you're interested, after this lecture, to find out a little bit more about his own writings, uh, you can start with this volume, uh, John Rusbrook, as it's called, from the uh, Classics of uh, Western Spirituality, uh, which is a very well-known series, and there's a, a volume dedicated to a number of Rusbrook's works. Uh, Rusbrook was beatified in uh, the 20th century, uh, so he's blessed. We're waiting for another miracle, and then he'll be properly sainted. Um, Why do I really like Rusbrook? Well, for two reasons, basically. First of all, uh, he has one of the most dynamic understandings of the theology or the doctrine of the Trinity in the medieval West. There's absolutely no doubt about it. It is shockingly original uh, insofar as I can see. Um, then secondly, uh, this doctrine of the Trinity isn't just interesting as it is in its own right. It isn't just some sort of doctrine that is out there but it actually is being applied to the Christian life in a very original way. And as you know, um, people sometimes are wondering, you know, this theology of the Trinity, how is that actually relevant for the Christian life? Well, Rysbrook makes clear that it's at the very heart of the Christian life. So that's what, what I hope to try and show to you uh, tonight, uh, and we will work our way through some of the texts. I have said that uh, Rysbrook is, is, is very original in his key idea, and I'll try to explain that, but that doesn't mean that he hadn't read any sources. And one of those, I think, is St. Bonaventure. Now, <coughs> um, I've included there the uh, little extract from the Creed of uh, Nicaea Constantinople, just to sort of refresh your mind. St. Bonaventure obviously works in that tradition, and he basically argues that and this is a medieval development, that from the fruitfulness of his loving nature, the Father produces his word, and hence, you know, in the creed, God from God, light from light, true God from true God. So the Father, out of the fruitfulness of his uh, paternal nature, produces the word, because love is fruitful. Love wants to share itself, so the Father wants to share itself with uh, the Son, and from their mutual contemplation, the Holy Spirit proceeds as their bond of love. So that's basically, uh, in two sentences, what Bonaventure is saying um, on what we call the divine processions. So a generation by word from the fruitfulness of the divine nature, the paternal nature, and then uh, the procession of the Holy Spirit as love. Rysbrook adopts this. Um, and this is one of the main reasons why I'm, I am convinced that he had read some of the Franciscans. It could also be the Summa Hallensis, but, or, or it could be Bonaventure. It doesn't matter. Uh, he adopts the idea that it is the fruitfulness of the divine nature, which is the principal cause, as he puts it, of all creatures, and indeed of the generation of uh, the word. Um, in the passage that you have in front of you, then, the second paragraph, he says, neither from the fruitful nature, which he associates with paternity, this is Rusbrook now, okay, this is not Bonaventure, nor from the fact that the father gives birth to his son, does love, this is the Holy Spirit flow, but because of the fact that the son is born as another person, distinct from the father, in which the father sees him as born, and all creatures in him and with him, as the life of all things. You have echoes here of, of the prologue, according to John. Um, and because of the fact that the Son beholds the Father as fruitful and giving birth and himself, that is the Son, and all things in the Father, this is sort of mutual beholding, from this love, which is the Holy Spirit, and a bond between the Father and the Son, and between the Son and the Father, is brought about. Okay, this is more or less uh, what uh, Bonaventure had said as well. But then comes the innovation of Rysbrook, and it's quite extraordinary. With this love, the Holy Spirit, the persons are permeated, and through it, they embrace and flow back into the unity from which the Father is constantly giving birth. 
when they have flown uh, back into the unity, there is nevertheless no rest because of the fruitfulness of the nature. This giving birth and flowing back into unity is the activity of the Trinity. And that is why there is threeness of persons and oneness of nature. So what, what, what is this book saying here? Well, he's describing uh, elsewhere uh, the divine trinity as a flowing, ebbing sea. This is a wonderful metaphor, a flowing, ebbing sea. It's like a pulsating movement going out through the generation of the word, thought from God, light from light, uh, and the procession of the Holy Spirit. So that's the outgoing movement, generation of the word and procession of the Holy Spirit. And then, because the Holy Spirit is this bond of love, the divine persons flow back into the unity. That's the second movement, where they rest in enjoyment. They sort of, in plain English, enjoy their, well, in the, to use a technical term, their perichoresis, that sort of mutual indwelling. And then, because of the fruitfulness of the divine nature, the whole thing starts again. So it's a constant ebbing, flowing, a constant pulsating movement going in and going out. Um, so the least you can say about this is that it's extremely dynamic. It's also original. Um, if you look at the scholastics, because obviously Ruth's book is a spiritual author, um, I, I think he's gone to university, but we are not sure. Um, some of, of uh, his uh, fellow uh, Augustinian canons had gone to the university, we know that, but uh, we don't have the records in, in the case of Rus's book. Um, and anyways, um, sorry, I've, I've lost my train of thought now. Um, what was I saying? Ah, the scholastics, yes, thank you. Um, this moment of return uh, that Rus's book talks about within the, the divine trinity uh, is in Dutch, Wederbogen. Uh, and if you have a bit of German, then you can probably begin to make sense of some of the Dutch. But anyway, uh, in the Latin term for it would be regiratio. And um, Albert the Great deals with this notion of regiratio uh, in, in his own commentary on the sentences, in his own doctrine of life. And he rejects it. He says, we can talk of a regiratio, of a return, uh, in terms of the entirety of creation going back to God, to the Son, perhaps, fine. But uh, so the creation can be said to return to God, because God is the Alpha and the Omega, the origin and the end of all things. But we should not apply it to the life of the Trinity itself, which is exactly what Rus's book does. And the reason why Albert rejects this notion of a return within the Trinity itself is because he feels it takes away of the power to bring forth uh, the Son and the Spirit. It, it's a case of, and we all hate this, return to sender, right? You, you send a letter and it's coming back and you feel a bit cheesed, cheesed off, right? So it, he felt it takes away from the power to spirate uh, for, of the Father and the Son because it's coming back, so to speak. So that's, that's why uh, Albert rejected this. And uh, Thomas follows him in this, in, in his commentary on the sentences. So Thomas does talk about regiratio once, I think, in his commentary on the sentences. Um, another figure that I could say a few words about is Meister Eckhart. Um, Meister Eckhart is earlier than Rusbrook, uh, the, the great German Dominican. Um, Rusbrook has read Meister Eckhart, there's no doubt about it. But um, whereas Meister Eckhart says things similar to Rusbrook in terms of a return, he always associates it primarily with the word, with the intellect. It becomes a very intellectual thing, so to speak. Um, intelligence, consciousness is always uh, self-consciousness. You, you can look at yourself, so to speak, that's what self-consciousness is. Uh, and this sort of reflective movement, if you like, that accompanies all thinking, uh, that is how uh, Meister Eckhart uh, sees the word or the sun. Rusbrook, on the other hand, clearly identifies the moment of return with 
the Holy Spirit. Anyways, um, enough about this. Um, that's basically his understanding of the Trinity. What I now want to do is explain to you how Rusbrook applies this to um, the life of the Christian. And that, that's really quite exciting. Um, so if you're on page three, you will see that I uh, have identified um, three aspects according to Rusbrook. He calls them lives, namely the active life, which is a life of virtue. And that uh, mirrors the life of engaging with the exterior world. Now, think back. The first movement within the Trinity was outgoing. Remember that? The going out of the Son as the Word and the going out of the Holy Spirit as love. Generation and procession, if you like, within the Trinity. So that was the outgoing movement. Well, says Rusbrook, the life of virtue where you engage with the outside world, that is a participation in that first movement. Do you see that? So you engage with the world, you, uh, you do lots of good works and so on. So that is a uh, participation, a sharing in the outgoing uh, within the Trinity, namely the generation of the word and the uh, procession of the Holy Spirit. Then secondly, I have mentioned to you that the originality of Rusbrook's uh, theological vision is that you have this moment of return of the divine persons into the paternal uh, unity. And that is mirrored in the Christian life through a life of interiority, going inward, a life of prayer, devotion, right? So that's the ingoing movement that mirrors the movement of the two divine persons into their paternal unity. Uh, it's the inner life or the God yearning life. And then thirdly, you have what he calls the contemplative life, uh, where you rest in God. Now, resting in God should not be understood in a sort of experiential term, I think, um, or where you enjoy God. That's, that's the other term he uses to describe this third moment. Uh, I think it needs to be understood in, in light of what Augustine says about enjoying God. And what does Augustine mean when he talks about enjoying God? He means that in whatever we do, God has to be our ultimate concern. Your ultimate concern, what, what really life is about for you, can be many a thing. It can be the nation, it can be power, it can be the local football team, which isn't doing very well these days. Um, so it can be money. Uh, prestige, whatever, or it can be God. And if it is God, if God is your ultimate, that's going to completely transform your life. And that, that, that is what Rusbrook means by resting in God or enjoying God. And he calls that contemplative life. Now, you might be forgiven for thinking that the contemplative life is the highest life uh, over the active or, or the interior life. And in one sense, it is. But it's actually not the climax of Rusbrook's spiritual ideal. The climax of Rusbrook's spiritual ideal is not the active life or the life of virtue. It's not a life of interiority and prayer. And it's not a contemplative life. It's a, it's a combination of all three. And that is what he calls the common life. Uh, or in Dutch, gemeene leven. Now, gemeen in, in German, gemein, uh, has connotations of ordinary as well. Um, even certainly in modern Dutch, it has connotations of vulgar, but it mustn't have had that in, in, in Rusbrook's time. So the common life is, is a life that combines basically charitable activity and interiority and resting in, in God. And that for Rusbrook is his ideal. That is what the Christian life is about. So on page three there, we have a little quotation uh, which sort of resonates with the sort of Trinitarian dynamic that I was talking about. So God's spirit breeds us out to love and perform virtuous works. And he draws us back in. So that's the return. Uh, he draws us back into God, into himself, to rest and enjoy. This is an eternal life. Just like in our bodily life, we breathe air in and out. So to go in, in idle enjoyment, and to go out with works, 
and always remaining united with God's spirit. That is what I mean. Just like we open and close our bodily eyes so quick that we do not feel it, likewise, we die in God and we live from God and constantly remain one with God. So you see, there's always three moments, if you like. Thus, we will go out in our ordinary life and go in with love and cleave to God. That's the second moment. And always remain united with God in stillness. That's the third moment, the moment of rest or fruition. Um, so you can begin to see how he sort of uh, sees a Christian life as a life of participation uh, in the life of the Trinity. Right, um, if you go to page four then, I've given you a long extract from uh, a book, The Sparkling Stone, which is a quite, quite short work, really, by Rusbrook, and he describes those three lives in terms of faithful servants, friends, and sons. So faithful servants are those who lead a life of activity, the friends are those who lead a life of interiority, and the sons are those who lead a life of, of, of contemplation and fruition of God. And at the end of the extract, and we probably won't have time to read it all, but nonetheless, at the end of the extract, he will say, basically, you need all three. Right. So, um, I've chosen this extract to make clear to you that what Rusbrook is describing is basically a transformation of the self. And that's an important point. Because when we think of or hear about mystics, we, being modern people, we sort of associate it mostly with a sort of experience of God, a sort of direct, immediate experience of, of God. On the 6th of May, I, I saw the light, and it has changed me, and, and so on and so forth. And so forth. A sort of direct, immediate experience of God would have been problematic for medieval authors, I think, generally speaking, because God is beyond experience. God is an object, is not an object in this world. Um, so mysticism and mystical theology, uh, as, as I understand it, is not so much about an experience between a subject and God, but it is about a transformation of the human self, which is something altogether different, um, through faith, hope, and love. And through this transformation, basically, you need to go of the possessiveness that contaminates all our dealings with the world, our sort of self-centeredness. We need to let go of that. And that is what this book means with, by saying dying in, in, in God. And this is what he describes um, uh, in this text from the, <coughs> from the Sparkling Stone. So, um, we'll just try and read... Uh, some of this text and, and see how far we get. Now you should observe, he says, that some persons receive God's gift as his hired servant, so they're actually out of the framework, if, if you like, while others do as his faithful servants. The faithful servants are those who lead an active life. These differ from one another in all their uh, interior activities, that is, in love, in intention, in feeling, and in all the works and exercises of the interior life. Now note well as follows. All who love themselves so inordinately that they do not wish to serve God except for the sake of their own profit and reward cut themselves off from God and live bound up in self-love since they seek and intend themselves in all that they do. So he's talking about the hired servants. They're, they're not even really part of the Christian life because whatever they do, they do it uh, out of pure self-love. In all their prayers and good works, they seek temporal things, or else strive after eternal things for the sake of their own advantage and benefit. Such persons have an inordinate devotion to themselves and accordingly always remain alone. This is actually, I find that quite perceptive. If you read a, a life of effectively pure self-centeredness, then you're going to be always alone. Because you can't interact really, not with God, nor indeed with other people, not in a proper sense. And he explains, for they lack that authentic love which would unite them with God and all his beloved. Although such persons appear to keep the law and the commandments of God and the Holy Church, 
they do not keep the law of love. For everything they do is done of necessity and not out of love. That is, they act only to avoid damnation. Again, I, I think this is quite profound. I think this goes to the heart of what Christianity is about. Um, to put this into context, w one of the big mistakes of, of the Enlightenment was to basically understand the merits of religion very much in terms of ethics. So we don't really believe all that stuff of, 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 of Trinity and so on. But Christ, I, he, he's a decent fella. So, you know, we, we can follow him. Okay, so um, th th this reduction of religion to ethics, to morality, goes completely and utterly against the nature of Christianity. Because Christianity is ulti ultimately about love. Now, love will imply a following a certain amount of, of, of rules and, and commandments, undoubtedly, but you cannot reduce love to following certain duties or rules. I mean, take a very mundane example. Um, a couple of weeks ago, it was St. Valentine's, I think. If, uh, if a man buys flowers for his spouse because that's what you do, you must do it on St. Valentine's. He's fulfilling his duty. Okay, he's fulfilling his duty, but you might wonder where, where is the love in all of this, okay? Uh, so the, the, what I'm trying to say is there is an excess, there's a gratuity about love which can never be captured in terms of rules and commandments, necessary though they may be, okay? Uh, so the problem with these people uh, that uh, Rusbrook is describing here is, uh, well, they keep the law, but they don't keep the law of love. Um, so, because they're ultimately too self-centered. They are interiorly unfaithful, as he puts it there at the bottom of page four. They dare not trust God. So their entire interior life is one of doubt, fear, and uh, misery. On the right side, they see eternal life, which they are afraid of losing. And on the left, they see the eternal pains of hell, which they are afraid of receiving. All the prayer and labor and good works which, which they can perform in order to dispel the fear are of no avail. For the, the more inordinately they love themselves, the more they fear hell. Um, the next paragraph, he says, well, in, in that very hour, with God's help, when we are able to overcome our self-love, then we become so empty of ourselves that we dare to trust in God. And then we become the faithful servants. And that's effectively the first part of uh, participation in the life of the Trinity. Um, so you lead a life of uh, virtuous activity as a faithful servant, but there is still a big difference, and this gets us to the next paragraph. Uh, uh, there's a great difference, he says, between the faithful servants and the secret friends of God. By means of God's help and grace, the faithful servants resolve to keep God's commandments, that is, to be obedient to God and to the Holy Church in all kinds of virtue and good behavior. So these are good people, right? And by the way, we're all these people, you know, all of us are, are these different people faithful servants and, and friends and so on. Now, this is called an exterior life or an active life. Okay, so the notion that this is a life of engaging with the outside world and doing good works, uh, which mirrors the outgoing of the Son and the Holy Spirit. But the secret friends of God, he says, resolve to keep not only God's commandments, but also his life-giving counsel. That is, to maintain a, f a loving and fervent adherence to God for the sake of his eternal glory. So not our glory, but his eternal glory. Together with a voluntary renunciation of everything apart from God, on which a person could set his desire and affection. God calls and invites such friends to turn within. So again, the metaphorical, the metaphor of interiority is important here. So he invites such friends to turn within, giving them powers of discernment in interior exercises and revealing to them the many hidden ways of leading a spiritual life. On the other hand, God sends his servants outward so that they may faithfully serve him and his people in all manner of exterior good works. Um, I will skip a few um, 
sentences. So a sentence that starts with, although he keeps God's commandments. Do you see that? Okay. So although he keeps God's commandments, he constantly remains interiorly unenlightened, ignorant of what interior exercises are and how they are to be practiced. He's talking about the faithful servant. Uh, typical example, uh, you know, well, well, you have monks in monasteries. What's the use of that? They don't do anything useful. Okay? So that, that would be the reaction of the faithful servant, somebody who's very much concerned about, with getting things done uh, for the benefit of humankind. Um, since he knows and feels that he has his mind directed to God, and desires to do his holy will in all his works, he allows himself to be satisfied with this. For, for he finds himself to be free of hypocrisy in his intentions and faithful in his service. So we're talking about good people here, but they get a sort of satisfaction out of the works that they do, right? He's pleased with himself because of these two points, and thinks that exterior good works performed with an upright intention are holier and more beneficial than interior exercises, since with God's help he has chosen an active way of life. He accordingly devotes himself more to performing exterior works with clear discernment than to showing interior affection towards him for whose sake he performs such works, i.e. God. This is why his mind is filled more with images of the works he performs than with God. I, I don't know whether any of you know uh, Pascal and his pensée. Um, the key notion in Pascal's thought is the notion of distractions, divertissement, uh, where we can sort of, be, we become scattered, we, we lose our focus, we lose our focus because we lose ourselves in a thousand and one, um, well, attractions, if you like, of, 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 of you know, looking forward to uh, Ireland beating uh, Scotland in the Six Nations. Uh, I'm looking forward to better days in, in Sunderland, uh, AFC. Um, so these can be distractions. And they, Pascal says they are our blessing and they are, the, at the same time, they are our biggest curse. They are our blessings because they make life livable. You know, you have something to, for, to look forward to. But they also can be, they can be curse because they, Sometimes we can become scattered, di diverted by all of these things, and we lose our focus upon God. Uh, we fail to face up to the big questions of life. We can li live on the surface, so to speak, uh, through all those distractions. And in, in a sense, Rusbrook is saying here, well, these works can become a kind of distraction, in, almost in the sense that Pascal means. Um, he uses the word images, which, I mean, in German, you would have uh, built, in, in Dutch it's build. It's a very rich word because it's also imagination is, 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 is very much connected uh, with that notion of uh, images or, or distraction. It, it works in German and Dutch, it doesn't work in English. Um, so he's so filled with images in his works that he remains an exterior kind of person and is incapable of responding to God's counsel. His exercises are more exterior than interior, more sensual than spiritual. So he's a faithful servant, but what secret friends experience uh, is hidden and unknown to this person. Predictably, then, uh, Rusbrook refers to the passage from Luke about Mary and Martha. Um, and of course, Mary chose the better part, which would never be taken from her. Uh, and that better part according to this book, was love that Mary had for Jesus. Uh, as he says in the third paragraph on page six, the one thing which is necessary for everyone is divine love. And the better part is an interior life marked by loving adherence to God. This is what Mary Magdalene chose, and it is also what God's secret friends choose. Martha, however, chose an exterior active life that was free of hypocrisy. And this is the other part or way by which a person may serve God. But it is less good and less perfect. This is the part that the faithful servants choose for love of our Lord. So he, he, he's not saying that the active life is bad or anything. He's not saying you shouldn't do the active life or engage in it. No, but um, it, 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 it's not quite um, 
uh, at the same level, if it's a bad metaphor, uh, uh, as the interior light. Uh, the next paragraph um, is interesting, but I, I won't go into this, because uh, Rysbrook, this is quite remarkable. He describes practices that we today in the 21st century would associate with sort of meditation. Uh, he's describing practices of people who sit down and become completely empty of themselves. And uh, he says, well, this is not necessarily bad, but it can become, again, something that doesn't allow you sufficiently to focus upon love for God. Um, religion as, a, as some sort of practice in relaxation or anything. Um, but I, I won't go into that. Then the next paragraph brings us to the secret friends and the hidden sons. There is another difference that can be observed, one which is deeper and more subtle, namely that which exists between the secret friends who lead his life of interiority and the hidden sons of God who lead his life of contemplation. Through their interior exercises, these two groups do indeed stand equally upright in God's presence. There is, however, a certain self-centered quality to the interiority of the friends. This is a key sentence. The life of religion comes, hopefully, at times, with its own consolations. <laughs> but those consolations can become, if you like, a sort of attachment. And again, you need to let go of that in order to become a hidden son of God. Um, people sometimes say when an affliction befalls you, they say, oh, well, at least you have your faith in God. But there's something, in, in one sense, that is correct. But in another sense, it, it, it's a, almost mildly condescending. And there's, al <laughs> there's also something wrong about saying that. Because ultimately, again, coming back to my earlier point, the Christian faith is not about the consolations that it brings, but it is about our relationship with God through Christ. That's what it's about. And even if the consolations fall by the wayside, we should still stick to that. That's, we should get our priorities right. <laughs> so there's a certain self-centered quality, he says, to the interiority of the friends. Uh, they choose their loving adherence to God as the best and the highest state which they can wish or wish to attain. For this reason, this is quite remarkable language, really. For this reason, they cannot transcend themselves or their works so as to reach a state of imageless bareness. For their works and their very selves constitute a distraction, an image, an intermediary. So what he is trying to point us to is a state of uh, self-transcendence, where we are no longer attached to our works uh, or indeed our very self. And this runs deep. I mean, we're also, everybody is, is, is to a great extent, of course, protective and, atta and attached to oneself. If, if, if somebody says to me, Rick, you went wrong there, my immediate reaction is going to be, no, I didn't do it, or if I did, to admit it, yeah, okay, I did it, but there are attenuating circumstances. What am I doing? I'm protecting my own self. Okay? I mean, we all, we all recognize that. Um, so there is a certain possessiveness, a certain attachment to the self, which we need to overcome um, to attain the, the fullness of, of love for God. Um, so at the bottom of page six, even though they feel themselves, they being the secret friends, even though they feel themselves to be raised up to God in the strong fire of love, they retain something of their own self and so are not consumed and burned to nothing in the unity of love. By the way, Rysbrook is not a Buddhist. Rysbrook is not saying, get rid of the self. That would be the Buddhist way. Rysbrook is saying, yes, there is a self, but it shouldn't be possessive of self. And that's a key difference between Buddhism and, and, and Christianity. Um, so even though they wish to live constantly in God's service and please him forever, they do not wish to die in God 
to all the self-centeredness of their spirit and to, and to lead a life completely conformable with God. Even though they attach little weight and importance to all the consolations and rest which might come to them from without, so they're not concerned about money or, or, or power or whatever, but they attach great importance to God's gifts and to their own interior works, the consolations and sweetness which they experience from within. Thus, so, sorry, they thus rest along the way and do not fully die so as to attain the highest victory in a love which is bare and devoid of particular forms and of self-centeredness. Um, so there is therefore, next paragraph, a great difference between the secret friends and the hidden sons of God. For the friends experience within themselves nothing more than a loving, life-giving ascent, which is marked by particular forms. While over and above this, the sons experience a simple, death-like passing over into a state devoid of form. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit. And... Go to the next page. Um, so page 8. Nevertheless, you should know that all the faithful and good persons are the sons of God, for they've all been born of, of God's Spirit, who lives in them and moves and impels each one in a particular way, according to his cap capability, to the virtues and good works through which a person becomes pleasing to God. Um, because of the inequality in the ways they turn to God and in their practices, I call some of them faithful servants, others secret friends, and still others hidden sons. Yet they are all servants, all friends, and all sons. For they all serve, love, and direct their minds to the one God, and they all live and act out of God's free spirit. Okay? So... so um, <coughs> Basically, um, this book calls the, the, or, or describes the Christian life as, as a life of activity, interiority, and uh, resting in God. And he uses the um, metaphors of the uh, faithful servants, the uh, friends, and the hidden sons uh, to describe those three patterns, which, if combined, constitute what he calls the common life. Uh, which can be translated actually almost like universal life or indeed the Catholic life, because that's what Catholic means. Uh, so it, it combines um, activity and uh, interiority and resting in God, which in turn is a participation in the life of the Trinity. Okay, I think I've spoken uh, too long even at this stage, so uh, we'll have a little break or, or make time for questions now. Open the window for I think to very different era of the church and very different uh, way of 